Hey campers, I apologize, we're a few minutes late. We were talking too much. This is an amazing, amazing Facebook Live and I think we're all gonna have a lot of fun because Gwen has got a good sense of humor. She's got a lot to say. And um, hopefully we're gonna impart some really quality advice for you, the owner, to get the best out of your practice. Because actually, you know, both sides of the table are trying to do the best for your dog and that's the truth. And sometimes miscommunication can happen, even though people are trying really, really hard on both sides of the table. So tonight we're going to be talking about a different combination of pain and behavior. It's not the behavior that the dog expresses because of the pain. It's the behavior around dealing with pain from the human side of things. So Gwen, tell them about you. <laughs> well, what an introduction. Um... My name's Gwen. Um, I'm a veterinary surgeon. Um, I worked in practice for a couple of years and then I decided to do a few different things. So I worked as a clinical anaesthetist at the um, Edinburgh Vet School. Uh, I worked with, I worked with pig vet for a little bit. And then I decided that I needed a complete change and I became something called an innovation consultant, which before I, was, before I became one, I would have thought it was the most jargon and sounding job that you could possibly have. But basically what I am is I work at a company with about 50 other people with lots of different backgrounds. So we have three vets. We also have probably 15 physicists, another 10 biologists of different flavors, um, chemists, designers, behavioral scientists, which is why I'm talking to you tonight, and then a whole host of other people who help the company to work. And what we do is that very big companies, um, companies like Shell, like Procter & Gamble, like Johnson & Johnson, like Pfizer, um, like Cadbury, so Mondelez owns Cadbury. Big names. Big names. Um, people who own Timberland bands, like a lot of the big clothing brands. We work with these companies, and they come to us and they say, look, um, my company's called Navia. Look, Navia, we've got, this, um, we've got this problem. We don't know how to fix it. Or we've got this product, we think it's really cool, but we don't know quite how to use it. And then my company brings a group of people together, the people from very different backgrounds, and we think about this problem and we say, we, we kind of work through the process and we say, look, um, our advice would be to do this with what you have. And so, does that give you, I mean, you're not. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing. Does that give you just, of you? Do you just drop in the fact that you're also a teleconsultant for rabbit behavior of your own company and you've written a textbook from years of experience. I was just like, oh. <laughs> so that's my that's my hobby and I can tell you when you know people, people say what's your hobby and you say well I'm actually passionately interested in how pet rabbits behave it's quite niche I won't lie and um oh. every so often you get someone who's like oh tell me about my rabbit or I had a horrible rabbit when I was a child but basically um about eight years ago I had a rabbit that was an absolute you know, it was a very it was very very unhappy had lots of behavioral problems and I tried to find some help and I found that there was there was just nothing um, there was nothing really available. So I published some articles, and then I set up a, a teleconsultancy. So anyone who had problems with their rabbits or questions about their rabbits could then get in touch. And so I have spoken to a huge number of rabbit owners right around around the world about their specific problems with their rabbits. And then I wrote quite a lot of stuff in various veterinary journals. And then a publisher um, got in touch and said, "Oh, do you want to write a book?" And I was like. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> so, yeah, I published a book like two years ago and I worked with a rabbit welfare. Have you got his hand? Can you show them? Show uh, them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, wait, look at it. Oh, my laptop's resting on it, so it's not. <laughs> there we go. Wow. <laughs> that's amazing. So, yeah, that's my, um, that's my background. Very diverse. So, we have a multi talented. I have to tell people why I asked to speak to you. Um, you actually appeared in my life in about 2016, I think, your first paper came out. And at that point, I was really wanting to try and influence vet practices about their chronic pain management. And I saw this article, and it just said everything that I felt. And I refer to it in lectures. I often use it definitely to boost nurse morale. And we always talk about the fuddy-duddy, the Luddite, the Neanderthal, the person that's a bit slow to the upset, you know, uptake of pain, and they tend to be male, and they've been out of university for a long period of time, and we now have proof. <laughs> so I quite often use it to kind of get the nurses going, yeah, we're good, we're good at this, we're female, we're young, yeah. And um, 
your paper just was brilliant. And so when I saw you do the Vibet recently, um, you did a brilliant lecture, and it's I think it's available for people to watch. I was like, right, got to speak to her. And here we are. So what we've decided to talk about is two articles that you've written. One was very much directed at nurses, and one was much more broad. But it was looking at um, how our behaviour can be modified to better manage pain in practice. Mm -hmm. This is very relevant, guys. So if you don't know about our um, community group, it's called Holly's Army, um, please go there. There's about four to 5,000 owners supporting each other. And things that come up quite a lot is, oh, yeah, well, my vet's not very receptive to that. Or I don't think my vet believes me. Or he just seemed disinterested. Or I felt really rushed. Or... Um, my vet doesn't want me to try different therapies. Um, and there's a real negativity in some people's um, experience at their vets. So I was kind of thinking about this. Maybe there's a bit of miscommunication there. Maybe the vet on the other side table is going, yes, 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 yes. But the vet, the owner's not receiving it. Mm. There's an imbalance. So I thought we'd talk for it. So first thing is for us to talk about what is behavioral science? Okay, so that was the question when I, that I had when I started with my job. And mm -hmm. behavioral science fundamentally is the study or it encompasses a whole load of different disciplines that are all dealing with the subject of human behavior, but from lots of different angles. So it usually includes sociology, psychology, anthropology, and then behavioral aspects of biology, economics, geography, law. I mean, it's very, very broad. But what it tries mm -hmm. to do is create um, create models of what drives people's behaviour in certain situations and then validate those by doing research against those theories to end up with validated models where we can say, look, actually, we know that, you know, in response to a threat, there are actually a fairly limited number of options and the behaviour that results is a function of, for example, the, these three categories of, of factors leading in. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think I've got a head start because I've read your articles and mm -hmm. I... I'm a very visual person that kind of likes flow diagrams and mm -hmm. your articles have that. So I'm going to put a link um, mm -hmm. underneath so people can read them. They're very easy read. They're what, 10, 15 minute type read? Mm -hmm. um, and they have very clear take home points. And I think you guys will kind of learn a lot from it. So nurses get in there, vets, have a look. You'll be surprised. Because at the end of the day, all we want to do is create happy owners, happy pets, and work in a happy working environment. And believe it or not, you know, most people that work in vet practices are quite class A personality types. They want to do their best. That is in their nature. And having a day where you haven't got on well with your clients or you've had a client phone and say that they weren't happy with your service really eats deep, you know? And um, so let's kind of go into it a bit further. So question number three, I did my homework. What are common challenges of managing pain from a first opinion vet perspective? So owners listen in because it's on the other side of the table. So you've gone in, you're a bit stressed, you're a bit upset, you've got your dog, and it's very easy to be in your bubble. Just think about what's happening on the other side of the table, where that challenge might be. Great, and when what I'm gonna do, I think if I just take a little bit of a step back actually and explain why, why we are thinking about the broader context of all these people because it's very easy to think okay so i want i want a vet to treat pain in my animals and i know that my vet is the only one who can prescribe that drug so the entire burden of that decision you know therefore would be on the vet but actually we know that that there is there are many other factors that determine whether or not a vet will give pain medication. Um, and that's not even just between the owner and the vet, but as we said, between the, the nurse who feeds the animal, um, it, between the receptionist who brings the animal, between the practice manager who sets the policy. So we've actually got this very wide ecosystem of people who are interacting and with your dog at the centre of it. So what we have to do is when we're thinking about how we how we help to ensure that the, the, the dog and the, the owner and the dog have the best experience, we really want to think about that really broad context. Yeah. When we're thinking about problems, um, why the behavior doesn't happen? So let's we're gonna think back to the, you know, I'm gonna keep it really, really simple and I'm just going to have the, the vet giving appropriate pain relief. 
And I know yeah. that that happens, but let's just focus on that for the moment. So when we think about why or why why or why not that happens, we think we call the, the factors that influence behavior barriers, so things that will stop people performing the behavior, and promoters, things that make it more likely. And so if we think about that, you know, that that bet on the other side of the table. There are various things that will influence how how much attention the, the, the vet has to give. You know, if they are at the end of a three hour shift, they are going to be really physically exhausted. And no matter how much they want to put the effort they, they, they did at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, that can be really hard. <clears throat> but I think there's also quite often for vets a real trade off where, you know, we go into it because we love animals and we have a vocation. And then when we graduate, we start treating vets, we're having to charge for the service. And this mm -hmm. is a real tension where we're wanting to do the best, but often we actually feel quite guilty that there is a financial component um, and a financial cost of what we recommend. And that mm -hmm. often we found in papers that vets often disproportionately weight the cost for owners. So a lot of owners actually, the cost is not a big factor when they're deciding whether or not to treat their dog. And there are many other things that influence it, but vets often think that the cost is what really puts things um, out of their reach. And so but I think that is also because of previous experience. I think some vets have had such negative experiences from prescribing their gold standard plan and the vet will go and the owner goes, no, mate, no, I'm not interested. What, what are you charging me that for? And be a bit derogatory. And it's such a negative experience. You get five or six of those under your belt. It really influences how you behave thereafter. So experience really does affect that. Yeah, and actually you touched on another aspect, which is that humans disproportionately weight bad things in comparison yes. to skin. So we're much more likely to avoid risk than to yes. try to shoot for the best outcome, the real reward. And so yes. that can be a real problem because a couple of bad experiences can outweigh 10 really positive experiences. Yes. That's just human nature. And I've got another example, a classic one for me would be that if I had a dog come in for a vaccine, say, and that dog walked in, it had an arch back, dropped tail, it walked quite crooked, and um, it's kind of quite a thick set neck, and you could see that this dog's actually been uncomfortable, and it's got a lot of adaptive changes with its posture and its physical appearance. There's pain here somewhere. You know there's pain here somewhere, but the owner's not aware. They just think it's aging. So in your head, you're going, right, I've got 10 to 15 minutes, I've got to do the vaccine, I've got to do the worming, I've got to do the full clinical health check. And I want to put this dog on pain relief. And I've got to break that barrier with that owner, convince them that there is pain, even though they didn't see that their best mate was in pain and how offended they're going to be. And then you've got to talk about non-steroidal, for example. You want to do it safely. You want to give them advice about how to use it safely. You know the likelihood of a reaction is 0.03%. 0.03%. Little gremlin comes out and goes, oh, what happens if it caused a marina? Oh, no, they didn't even think there was a problem. And I've just made two. <laughs> so you have all of these conversations in your head. And you're trying to hold a conversation behind a table, hold a dog, type up notes. It's very hard. It is really hard. And what happens is that if you're in that situation, you've had some negative experiences, you've got a lot of possible options, what well, you'll probably default to is the option that you think reduces, reduces as much risk as possible. And that does not, that often is not gold standard because the gold standard one is the one with the financial cost and the effort and the all conversation. And then it's the best of intentions and it's what the vet expects will work for the majority of their clients. But that, that does mean that there are trade-offs to that. It's very, mm -hmm. easy. it's just, it's, it's very human. It's very human. And I think other things that are, um, are challenges to the vet, which I say on a daily basis, is being a first opinion vet now is hard because the expectation to know about skin, about heart, about digestive tract, about behavior, do all the different surgeries, you know, be able to look at blood smears, be able to skin scrapes, parasite identification, just do it, you know. And we have now got a huge wealth of CPD that it hits us on a daily basis. For owners to understand that CPD is continual professional development. When I qualified 18, 19 years ago, we had the vet times and the vet records. Nothing online, 
So you didn't get that feeling of inferiority all the time. Now we have about 20 magazines. We have online providers, bam, 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 all the time. What I'm trying to say is that that there, their speciality, that interest, because the brain is only so big, might be skin or it might be heart. And they're doing a really good job with pain management, but it's not their interest. And that's another kind of barrier is the brain is only so big. Um, so, yeah, sorry for biting. No, that's absolutely right. There are just, there are so many barriers of of the, the the behavior that you might want from the vet delivering gold standard service there's so many barriers that are in the way of them being able to do that for every client and mm -hmm. so again if we go back to that ecosystem when we just focus on the vet when we're thinking about how we change behavior and you know CPD providers, for example, will say, you need to do this, you need to do this. It's just not enough because there are so many other things that influence what that vet chooses to do. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And CPD providers, I can honestly say, back off, because <laughs> you just feel so insecure that you don't know how to resuscitate a lizard and then you do heart transplant with a dog. It's just like, whoa! <laughs> So that's, that's, that's the owner vet. I, I really hope that owners just pause, just step back, just have a moment where you go, what's happening on the other side of the table? And my biggest tip for owners is to say, look, I'm all ears. And I know that sounds daft, but when I'm trying to formulate a plan for you, I'm trying to work out what is acceptable to you, what is affordable to you, what is physically capable of you, I have so many things that I'm looking at you, I'm looking at what you wear, I'm looking at what you, your handbag, I'm looking at what car you drove in, I'm looking at what kind of dog you chose, I'm looking at how you handle your dog, how did you pick up your dog, what lead, what colour. I'm trying to get an assessment because what I want to do is work with you, not against you. And that does conflict a little bit with gold standard because if we did gold standard every time, we'd be robots. Mm. No emotion there. And there is emotion because we want the best out of the situation. So in that situation, for me, when an owner goes, look, I'm all ears, what are my options? It gives me the chance to introduce a range and say, well, we can go from here mm -hmm. to this, and there's a lot in the middle. Where should we go? And that is a very better working relationship in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, what's interesting there, um, Harris, you, you touched on the um, elements of the model um, that I, I use to apply to vets when you think about how the vet is thinking about the owner. So when the vet is thinking about the owner, um, the owner's ability to, to give, let's just say to, to, to um, buy the pain medication that they, they're then going to use. Um, yeah. We can think about their ability to do that in, um, in sort of three, three ways. So they need to have sufficient capability to do that. I'll explain that in a minute. They need to have sufficient opportunity to do it and they need to have sufficient motivation to do it. Because if those three factors are not present, then the owner will not use that pain relief. Yes. And so if we, if we just think a little bit more, the reason this, this, these three aspects are part of the model that I use in my papers, which is called the COMBI model. So capability, opportunity, motivation, leads to behavior. And this actually arose from the um, American legal system, which as part of it, proving whether some whether or not someone could commit a crime, they use these kind of three levers, you know, so they have the ability, did they have the opportunity to have, and that's very simplistic. Um, but, you know, as a framework for like them working out what fits under each bracket, um, they, they, they could then use that model and then flesh it out. And there's a whole suite of um, things that influence each of those aspects. Yeah. But, so when we understand that both for any behavior, to be performed, whether that's for the owner or whether that's for the vet, those three conditions have to be met. Yes. We can then think about all the things we could do as a function of affecting one or other of those groups. Yeah, no, I love that. And guys, seriously, I'll put the links. Would you mind if I um, screenshot those tables and put them up? As... Yeah, no, that's fine. Go for it. Because it really clarifies understanding the person that you want to work with. And I, I think it's really important because chronic disease like OA, you need a good report. And before we went live, we were saying that there is a really big hindrance for good working relationships at the moment in the vet industry. 
is because there is staff turnover. There is changing faces in a practice. You don't get to see the same vet day in, day out. And it is quite com complicated to build that good rapport. Um, so we talked about owner and vet. Let's let's be just staying a bit longer. Can you just play a bit more with the combi? Because I've got my list, the combi model, what is it? And then look at it from each stakeholder. Mm -hmm. We've done the, the vet is looking at the owner. So let me I'm looking at capability, opportunity, and motivation. I've touched on the fact that if that owner can't see pain, mm -hmm. they're motivated, and they're not going to give the meds, and they're not going to put the long change in, and they're not going to get the weight off. So I have 10 to 15 minutes to influence their motivation, which is really hard. Mm -hmm. I look at their opportunity. Um, so opportunity, is that more about their lifestyle, and whether they have the physical and financial and capabilities or have I gone the wrong way around? Yeah, you're right. So um, part of that, when we think about opportunity, we think about physical opportunity, which is about the environment. And that involves things like finances. And then yeah. we think about the social opportunity. So that's social influences. So that is, for example, the vet who sees other vets prescribing, or it's the owner who sees, you know, her, a, a preferred celebrity on Instagram talking about management of pain in their job. We need a celebrity, by the way, anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then we've got the capability and that is um would that also include looking at somebody um whether they physically could or uh, mentally and psychology psychologically remember to give is that capability yeah exactly so there's physical capability which is quite obvious and then there is psychological capability which includes knowledge um, but it also has memory, it has, um, you know, your kind of interpersonal cognitive skills, your ability to, to, to make that association with another party. But I think yeah. often we think as, as vets, you know, sometimes we're inclined to educate or to try and teach people and give them knowledge in the expectation that if we tell people that osteoarthritis is a, is, a, is a substantial problem that causes, you know, a lot of pain and suffering, that that, that will then change behaviour. But actually, if someone doesn't see the pain, or if someone can't give the medication, or if one any of the other barriers are present, just telling them again and again that that they need to treat their dog is really not going to change anything. No, 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 I totally agree. So just looking at the capability side of things, and I'm going to bring it into an OA consult, um, mm -hmm. I do regularly, is that I'll be looking at, is that owner going to be able to give a pill a day, a liquid a day, twice a day? Would I be better on trying... Um, mm -hmm. Am I going to get a better result if I choose a different approach? Are they going to do the weight loss? Am I going to give them too much too soon? So should I go weight loss or should I do lifestyle change? You know, I've got a, a dog with really bad arthritic paws and it's not only overweight, they're ball throwing, it's jumping in and out of the car. Pick one because I know that if I throw all three, they're just going to go. Yeah. So owners there is a lot going on in that vet's head trying to choose a treatment plan for you and we try and push it towards gold standard but sometimes we have to kind of get there piecemeal is my my understanding um got a couple questions how do you think video consults <laughs> are affecting vet owner relationships Ooh. it's a good question um so yeah i can see laura it was you that asked that one um <laughs> I don't know, so I'm not doing video conferences at the moment, um, video consults at the moment because I'm not in clinical practice, but I've done a lot of video consults over the years and I really like them because you're, you suddenly, when you're seeing inside someone's home, it's, it's not quite as clinical, you're actually relating to a person, um, so even though there is, you're physically more separate, I think there's the opportunity for you actually to be closer and have you're, you're, you're in a very familiar setting, you're in your home, you're likely to be more relaxed, you probably talk to other people on your laptop or your phone, not just your vet. So you automatically have a slightly different relationship with it. Yeah. Um, however, what is lost is that you know, there's quite a lot when you see a vet calmly and capably handling your pet and relating to your pet and talking to your pet and, uh, and in, in, interacting with them. That element is then quite lost. So I yeah. think there is a real balance to be had, but I think a good vet is a good vet whether they're on the other side of the, the consult table or the other side of the, the other side of the world on your screen, providing that they've got the ability to really talk to you and to listen to you and work out what you need for people. Yeah, I'm definitely finding a combination of the two really good. And so 
being able to see, handle, but then also be able to have an uninterrupted, undisturbed conversation by phone or video console. And I'm getting really nice results out of that. I've got a good working relationship with the owner. They feel confident to approach me and ask silly, what they call silly things. They're not silly. Um, but yeah, distraction is an interesting one. If only GDPR and everything didn't exist, I'd put up a photo of what happened in my console once. You won't believe it. So a lady came in with two children and a cat in a cat box. And we took the cat out of the box and on the table, all concentrating, and one of the child children disappeared. I'm not, I'm not joking. So we're a small concert room, we're like, where has this child gone? And it was like a seven, eight-year-old child had got into the cat box like Houdini. <laughs> we're like over her head. And she was fully in the cat box. <laughs> So distraction in the consult room is really hard. <laughs> owners that always bring their, their dog's mate to keep them company and they, the other dog's just over in the corner terrorising. <laughs> so I do think video consults can actually really work well and I think um, a combination of the two would, would be a really glorious way to move forward actually. You know, mm -hmm. that's a way that chronic diseases like this can be really well managed, some physical handling and communication. Um, and what could help the vet owner relationship via video consults? Ooh. Ooh. Um, lists. Bring lists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I think, so I, I actually, one of the barriers I was thinking about with, um, if we go back to one of the questions we had earlier, Hannah, when you said, you know, what, what is challenging for the vet in that consult? Um, I think one of the big things when you're dealing with pain is that as soon as the animal's got some adrenaline in its system, and it's, you know, it's got the vet, there are other, other dogs around, it's a bit stressed, it's had a, a slightly unpleasant experience before, it gets into your consult room, it would probably be trying pretty damn hard to mask a lot of the signs. And so I think like video consults are amazing for chronic pain in animals because you can see how that animal's behaving in its home environment, you can see how you know how it's eating and drinking, how it's spending its time, in a way that allows that allows that kind of you know external perspective. And I think yeah. those kind of I think video consults as a whole are going to get more and more fluid because both you know vets and owners and, and nurses are going to be more practiced. But I think that ability to see the animal in its natural environment is going to really bring benefits to both the owner and the vet for chronic pain management. Yeah, and that gives me a chance to plug something. You don't even realise that you're plugging CAM stuff. Um, in CAM, on the website, canineartpractice.co.uk, if you go to How Can We Help, and you go into Downloads and Resources, there's a PDF of how to take a good video. So one of the things that drives me crazy is when you've got a video, where someone's taking the phone video, it's going like that, and you're like, whoa! I think I've just developed empathy because you can't follow the dog at all. You can't see the posture. You see more grass and pavement. I mean, had ceilings. You know, we're like, nope. <laughs> so there's a really good instruction sheet on the, the downloads and resources of take a video from above, from the side, walk them past, walk them back, from the front, from the back. But it's all there. Please use it. Um, there's a load of resources, they're free of charge guys, just print them off and use them. Another thing, when we talked about lists, there is a um, suspicion of chronic pain. It's a PDF, it gives you a chance to think about behaviour change, posture change, physical changes, capability and gait changes. Then there's a little list by each one and you can write your thoughts and then you can actually show your vet and say, look, I think there's something going on because I've got these changes. So I limited for time and my dog's high on adrenaline at the moment and they look like they're absolutely fine but this is what I'm seeing at home and I'm concerned that there's pain so do think going prepared ha ah, oh we've got some things okay I called to see my brother and his dog yesterday we are now above we had stopped her medicam for two days because her pads had cracks in them and after looking up on the internet thought it was a liver he's severe pain due to side to come back problems but said it was only fair if he was stopping his meds he could not Stopping her meds, he could not take his. I told him to take for blood tests, but to me, she seemed like it was missing people. Oh, bless you, Patricia. That's very sweet. Um, so there's also a flip side. My vet only sees my dog when she's very poorly, down and unhappy. Oh, look, I can show it here. Um, here you go. Um, I send videos for happy to ensure the unhappy dog is not. That's actually a 
that's a very valid point. You know, if you've got the happy videos and you can say, look, look how different we are at the moment, that's really, really helpful. And as everybody keeps telling us, COVID is not going away. Um, this is the new norm. Start getting some strategies in place. Um, I want to dabble further with the stakeholders. And I um, this is one of the reasons that I got so attracted to you with your wonderful article. It's because you talk about the other people that play a really big role in managing pain in the practice. So who are they? So that owners can clap them because they're really important. Yeah, so... Um, the ones that I think there are three other people within that kind of practice environment that play a really key role. And two of them is not only you will see, and one of them you probably will not. So the ones that you will see will be the receptionist who greets you when your dog comes in, and they'll, they'll be the nurse who may help the vet um, doing the consult, they may do their own management consult, they may help you with your pet losing weight, they may help, help you with managing um, medication administration. Um, but those are the people who you will certainly see. The other person who you, you may not see is the practice manager who sets the practice policies on how you manage dogs with certain pain conditions. But they also um, help to arrange the CPD, so the training that Hannah talked about. So they may you know, almost set practice norms and um, social opportunities because they, they make forums that vets can discuss things in. So I think practice managers do play a pretty key role. I'm not going to talk too much about them today because you probably don't see them, but certainly recognise that they are playing a big role. Yeah. I just, can I just put in just there, just because I, that's something that's come up on Holly's Army, actually. There's always this confusion of why do a vet not stock a certain drug? Um, mm -hmm. There might be somebody that says, well, I went to my vet and they won't give me that one. They've given me this one instead. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the truth is, is that vets have a huge overhead and it is like a shop and, you know, you've got to stop what's going to turn over mm -hmm. and decisions have to be made about what's going to be frontline and what might be something that you choose to order in if it is required. Um, decisions like that have to be made and that doesn't mean that your vet's a bad vet, that means that your vet is thinking about the future and wants to be there in the future and they've therefore got to balance the books. Um, and the practice manager certainly would be involved in that. Um, another thing to consider as well, they're the person that kind of sets the potentially practice fees and how the reassessments are done, as you say, the protocols. So they are a big player, but as you say, they're not the people that you see. Yeah, well, let's think about the, um, let's think about the acceptance for a moment, because that's the first person you're likely to see when you come into the practice. Um, and I'm going to use the um, analogy you made earlier, Hannah, with um, the, the 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 person who doesn't recognise that the animal that their dog is in pain. Yeah. Um, and actually, the receptionist is often the person. Often, the, the turnover of veterinary receptionists is pretty low. So often, the receptionist actually knows a lot of the clients and knows a lot of the animals, and they've seen you know multiple generations of pets with the same owner. So they often yeah. have a really good rapport with the the owners. And if you imagine that you're bringing your dog in, and it's maybe you know seven or eight, and you've noticed it's a bit slower, but you haven't really. Um, you haven't really thought about it very much and it's in for its first vaccination. And if you then see so the friendly face behind the desk that you recognise who's you know seen Rover since puppy puppy vaccinations. And um that person says, Oh Rosa, you're looking you're looking a bit stiff nowadays. How you have you found it? Even if you don't mention arthritis at all, you suddenly have someone who knows the dog, who's empathised with the dog, who's raised a little bit of a, a thought in your head. Oh, yeah, I have been thinking that, but I wasn't going to bring it up because I don't want to think that Ray was actually getting a bit older. But suddenly you've got a little bit of permission to talk about it. And so that's why receptionists are a really key part of the practice in terms of helping owners and helping vets to do the right thing. Does totally that, agree. They're the eyes and the ears. They're the front posts. They're like the people that are, um, you know, the communicators. They're the supporters. They're the emotional pillars. They are massively important. And you'll be pleased to know, followers, that they are getting a lot more recognition now. So there is the British Veterinary Recep Receptionist Association, and they have their own kind of membership. They have their own CPD. So they're, they're being really empowered to take a bigger, bigger role. And I think that's brilliant. When we do practice training, so CAM do do practice trainings to try and improve chronic pain management. 
receptionists first because they're so fun to teach because they're like sponges. Um, and I'm going to do a terrible generalization. They tend to be like women <laughs> and they tend to be kind of like, yeah, you know, middle aged to more elderly. And um, they're the ones that stick at it. They've been there for years and they just want that information pass on and do good. They're fantastic people, but you're right. They're the ones that can plant the seeds, but they can also help the owner get what they want. So if the owner hasn't connected with the vet and the owner comes out and goes, I don't really understand what they said. <laughs> the receptionists are amazing translators as well, aren't they? They're mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, darling, what's this? <laughs> yeah. And they can also, and they can also signpost um, owners towards the resources within, I'm sure your training covers this, but within the practice. So, you know, why don't you come in in a couple of weeks and just speak to the nurse? As in, in a weight consult or something else, one of the other, you know, available ways that they can talk to a friendly face at the practice to just kind of you know, rehear some of the messages, or they can point them to resources if they know about them outside that can, can give them the sort of support they need. And also, yeah. when, people, when people are coming out of a consult and they are, as you say, confused or actually quite upset or like, you know, oh gosh, I hadn't really thought this is a thing. There's this emotional regulation that the receptionist can provide to help the message be able to filter in rather than just being walled off because of, of, of anxiety or stress. Yeah, yeah. So my kind of like take home for the receptionist kind of discussion is receptionist, you're amazing and you are allowed to say stuff. So keep doing your job really well. And um, there's a big fear about diagnosing. So there's a big fear that they're going to overstep the line. You are allowed to plant seeds and make observations. These are observations. He's a bit stiff. He struggled to get up there. He's really put on quite, you know, a few pounds, you know. Yeah. Um, you know he's quite panty. He's only walked from the car. You know, is that something that he's been doing recently? You're allowed to bring to their attention things that you feel that they should mention to the vet. You can also mention it to the vet. So I know some practices, they have um, little systems that where a pop-up can come on the vet's computer. So the reception say, did you know he actually really struggled to get out of the back of the car? Mm -hmm. There is a tendency for owners to go into a bit of denial. You know, we all do it. We want our pet to be with us forever. And sometimes we can bury our heads in the sand a bit. So receptionists, you're doing a great job. Um, love it. Now, owners make use of your receptionists because they are fantastic at filtering a lot of the complicated stuff and bringing it down to the nitty gritty. They're brilliant at being empathetic and they do listen much more than us vets. We tend to talk 100 miles an hour. Um, nurses. Oh, nurses are brilliant. And <laughs> as I, I mean, as you said, the evidence shows that nurses tend to be much more empathetic than vets, and so they they find it easier to recognise pain. And that's not really you actually tell about that, uh, that that reference. That yeah, it's I... in the paper. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember what it is, but it's in the re it's in the paper. But you can give you can give the summary. There is proof. Yeah, there is. There, I can't remember exactly what the paper showed. The, the paper tested, but there is. There is evidence to suggest that nurses do nurses do find it easier to recognise pain, and there are lots of reasons for that, right? Because you know vets have to make a lot of really tricky decisions. They see a lot of animals that that are painful. They often have very short amounts of time to to really spend engaging with that owner, and so there are a lot. I mean, there's a whole load of focus on how we help how we help own um, you know vets to avoid the sort of compassion fatigue side of things we are dealing with very, very traumatic cases very frequently. But yeah. nurses are in a really good position where they, it's like a vet, it's an often often vocational, usually vocational, um, and they have the, they have the training, they have the care training to really provide the support that is needed. And they can do this in a whole variety of ways, but Often they feel concerned, well, often they can be concerned that they don't want to tell the vet to prescribe pain, pain relief, which is completely fair. But there are lots of things that nurses can do that increase the chance of a vet providing pain relief. So highlighting when a dog seems to be painful or if they know a dog when it's worse or making an observation that indicates pain, as you, as you described. Or, um, you know, just showing empathy for the dog or showing an emotion to the dog and describing, you know, saying, oh, gosh, you know, you, that, that leg does look really sore. If you hear that as a human, you think, you, you, you recognise it, so you don't even have to say it to the vet. But creating that relationship with the animal and saying things can adjust our sort of automatic motivation 
by affecting the emotions that we're, we're feeling. So yeah. nursing is a really critical role. And I've just talked about nursing and vets. There's a whole other nurse owner thing, but a really critical role yeah. in that kind of ecosystem of care. Yeah, yeah, everybody plays a role. Um, just to big up a couple of girls, um, the White Cross girls, so it's a, a practice in the Midlands area, and they set up a fantastic OA clinic. Um, and we we followed their journey. And within the, um, the consult room, the floor is covered with non-slip. There's a bed in the corner, so when they're talking to the owner, the dog can be comfortable. There's snuffle mats, there's Kongs, there's literature to take home. There's all the different interventions like the licky mats and, and bits and bobs that owners should, you know, kind of invest in for quality of life reasons, etc. And um, they're busy. They're busy. Um, interesting one. A lot of nurse consults are free, and I, I personally don't feel that they should be because I think they get abused. People don't turn up. Um, my lovely friend Lindsay, she runs a OA clinic and quite often owners don't see value because it's the nurse and not the vet just not turn up and I think that's really sad because I know that the nurses have got so much of the nitty-gritty to, to add which is the game changers mm -hmm. uh, do you think we should charge for um, I think there is, well, there's certainly literature to suggest that if you feel that you're making some form of investment in a treatment option, you have more, you have more belief in its efficacy. And I think yeah. that when we, when we make them completely free, we do, we devalue both the nurses' time. We reduce the investment that the owner is making. And actually that then almost reduces the efficacy of what the owner is seeing. Yeah, no, absolutely. So owners, just to take home from that, if you have got a free of charge nurse consult, just just think how much energy goes into creating that. And the nurses that we have trained on our like OA roadshow, they are so invested. And I know from talking to the lovely Lindsay, who so Sue Knowles has just said, Lindsay, we love you. And um, talking to her, it actually really affects their confidence when people just don't turn up. So please don't do that. Um, we've got a couple of comments. Um, Megan says here, thanks so much, Hannah, for getting on to think about everything that we as a have to consider during the 10 to 15 minutes. I wish I had an hour for every dog with arthritis. And if the owner is willing, I often reschedule an appointment. Yes, 100%. You know, I could talk all day about arthritis. So 15 minutes is impossible for me now. Um, who's next? Martin Berry. Oh, there you go. Would an open day help with the vet owner relationship so owners and the animals can visit when the animal is in good health? So making animals visit a real love it. Yeah, defo. Yeah, there's so much potential. Um, something that I would love to do if I owned a vet practice, which will never happen, um, is I'd love to do like a scent garden, an proprioceptive garden, mm -hmm. and like an outdoor kind of area where when waiting, they can actually keep the dog calm you know, relaxed so that we see these dogs in a less heightened state. They're not on the slippery floor in the waiting room and they're not just getting themselves wound up, but have that area that they can meander, da, da, da. and then they come in and everybody's in a much better brain state. But uh, yeah, anybody can steal that idea, that's fine, don't worry about it. Um, so what we're gonna go on to next is a look at interventions an owner may wish their practice to consider. Um, so what kind of things do you think that owners may want from their practices? So any vets, nurses, practice managers or receptionists that are listening can go, well, that's a good idea and throw that to the team. What kind of things would you think of? Um, so this, so things that the practice can do or say to improve OA care at home? Um, probably in the practice. So yeah. I know some, some owners will write on Holly's Army, oh my goodness, I can't believe it, I've been looking after my dog and flooring and all that understanding and he went in for a sedation and x-rays and he came out ice skating and his legs were going everywhere and do you know what really upset me? Um, things like that. So for me, I would say have somebody in the practice, look at the practice with fresh eyes. Where could adjustments be made to the environment to make sure that these animals, whilst they're with us, are protected? You know, Bedding in the kennels, make sure they get out for little walks and wee walks to keep those joints moving, not laying on hard surfaces in the waiting room. Put a yoga mat down by the chair so the dog's got grip to stand up. Mm -hmm. You know, allow them to walk around the car park while they're waiting for their consult. Keep them moving, keep them calm. Those sort of things actually don't cost any money. Can you add to that? 
I mean, that was a pretty good list, Hannah. I feel like sort of like <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, what I was, what I was actually want, thinking about when you were, were talking about this. So, you, what you have talked about a lot is a whole load of different environmental restructurings that can affect how the animal is treated. And from a behavioural science perspective, I would say that is one of the routes that we can we can change behaviour at veterinary practices um, in terms of how the vets and the owners are dealing with, with the animals. But there are a whole load of other things we can do. And typically, we usually think about education first off. So we think, well, if we tell someone why it's important, they will do it. As I said before, that's usually a hygiene factor. So it's necessary that they know why, but it's definitely not the thing that changes behaviour. But there are lots of other things that you can um, that you can you can do. Certainly, as a as one of those stakeholders or as an owner, <clears throat> one thing that I think is really important that we touched on before: if you are an owner and you see a problem or you see something that is done really well, comment on it. And that's really important because as humans, we're so inclined to point out problems. So you say, "Yeah, the animals come home. It's really it's really sore. I don't know what you did to it when it was sedated, but it's much worse." I mean, yeah. that is the punishment that change that can change behaviour, but it's often very specific and it makes us feel quite defensive. But if you can outweigh, I mean, just like in dog training, if you outweigh one correction with ten positive things, yes. you're much more likely to leave the practice, leave the the people at the practice with very clear ideas of what works and what they should be doing. So you're reinforcing as well as punishing. And I would say that for owners. That is one of the biggest things you could do. Both praise, like don't just criticize, the praise is really vital yes. in behavior. Yeah, no, I love that. That is so important. And I keep trying to get people to understand a lot of people working in the vet industry go home and they are exhausted, especially at the moment. And these negativities can really hamper their confidence mm -hmm. um, and motivation. Um, a lot of people have been furloughed, so a lot of the people that are in practice now are working twice as hard um, and doing these kind of furlough shift swap overs. Mm -hmm. So they might do and then they swap, trying to keep the number of people in the practice at a minimum for social distancing. So people are at, you know, they're, they've got frayed nerves, shall we say. Mm -hmm. A vet may wish, what things a vet may wish their owner to consider to improve pain management in practice? Um, I think one thing that is really important is, is if, you, if, you're, if you're wanting to manage this properly, say that. You know, I really want to make sure that my dog is not painful. This means an awful lot to me. That then, as you said, it just... It helps the vet to go, okay, all right, so we're, we're this bucket of people. You're not having to do any sort of analysis. You're like, okay, you really want to do the best. Great, I really want to do the best. Let's let's do the best together. So being very explicit about what you want. And um, I think an another thing that is, actually, I'm going to just go back to the previous one with the own, what the owner can do to change what the vet does, especially with the animal hospitalized. There are two other things that I wanted to, to bring in. One which is modeling and one which is, um, uh, another form of environmental restructuring but from the owner's perspective so say you have a dog your dog needs to date you know dog needs a dental for example and he has quite bad arthritis and you're worried about how he's going to to find you know that that eight hour period in the in the veterinary practice there are two things that i would suggest one when you speak to the vet or the nurse when you're admitting the, the dog or when when you decide on the consult just explain what's been done before well so you know the previous vet i i saw did x y and z and this was really good because when he came home, you know, ABC. And yes. that, so that's not reinforcing because it's not that that has done the right thing, but you're creating an image of an aspirational outcome. And so the vet can go, okay, I want to be like that vet that did a really good thing for this person, right? So yes. that modeling is really powerful. And the other thing I would say to, that is probably daft, and I don't know whether they exist, but reminders are really important so you know even if you have the best intention when the nurse is going to get the dog out and it's a different nurse and you, you know you're in a bit of a rush they may not be thinking about exactly you know what those that dog's other conditions are so a collar tag or a sign on the on the um a sign on the kennel that says i'm a bit sore please take things slowly Massive we have <laughs> 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 we have dog tags so you know how someone is diabetic wear a bracelet we have dog tags in the shop that says be nice i'm arthritic 
So you can have that. And also we have the cam bandanas and that's one of the reasons we have them made is that we can't promise you that every person in that vet practice is going to know that your dog has arthritis. Mm -hmm. If coming for a lump remover or a dental or something else, put the bandana on. They can, if, they, if the dog's not actually wearing it during the actual surgery because they're trying to keep it clean, it can be on the kennel, tied. So people know the dog needs to be up and moving, it needs bedding, it needs to be turned regularly, it needs to be just treated with a little bit more comfort. <sighs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> we know that reminders are really effective in changing behaviour because yeah. we always think about the higher level processing that goes on, but in the, in the moment, it's very much lower level processing and that's what you can influence. Yeah, definitely. And this one I think is really good. Um, what can a nurse, what what interventions a nurse may wish their vets to consider? Because I've definitely delved into the other side. You know, I'm, I'm a vet. I've been a vet for 18 years. I've always gone really well with nurses. Um, but when you actually come in and start teaching them and seeing things from their perspective, it's, there's a lot of really passionate um, people that feel a little bit that they can't say what they'd like to bring into the their qualities, things that, the little changes that can make a big difference. Can you give that nurse any advice of how she can approach her practice and get the best out of it? Yeah, great question. So I think I think one thing that vets don't do very much is, don't do very well, is ask opinions because we're so used to being in the position where, where the, the opinion that's being sought is our own. But actually the yeah. more that vets can ask the opinions of owners and ask the opinions of nurses. You have to make far fewer assumptions and you increase the value of the contribution of all of those stakeholders. And now again, the problem, with, the problem for nurses is if they're shot down a couple of times, it makes it very hard to speak up. Um, this often, because of the power imbalance, can be quite a hard thing for a nurse to, to, to raise. So ideally, there would be communications with the practice manager and there would be some form of non-hierarchy session to try and establish that sort of two-way communication. However, not all, vet, not all nurses have that possibility. But there are things that they can do in the same way. They can, as, as some of the things we discussed before, so they can create emotion and create, create empathy for the, for the dog. Um, even, you know, throwaway comments, gosh, that does look really sore, doesn't it? Wow, he's barely putting his hind leg down. I can see why I can see why you're doing this. You know, it, you, can, you can do things in ways that support the other person's decision making, but highlight a problem that you see. Yeah. You can also, you can also, um, you know, go to someone if they're not there immediately when you do, when you do have a concern. If there is a receptive vet, pick your battle. But I think just having the confidence to say, um, I, you know, I'm a bit worried that, or I feel that this. It's not criticizing, it's making observation, it's not threatening, because it can't be, you can't be defensive if someone thinks something. But just having the confidence to say occasional things is really, really important, because you do have more empathy. You know, yeah. you that you know, have responsibility. Yeah. I feel like um, you have morphed a little bit because one of the, the, the statements that always makes nurses laugh is when we say there's always a Luddite in the practice, the dinosaur. Don't go to them first <laughs> because you're going to get shot down and then you're confident you're going, and you're going to say, oh. um, just so people understand the whole concept behind CAM, we've, we've tried to kind of really look at the problems that we perceive are there hindering improve chronic pain management, owner perspective, stakeholders, um, so the vets, the nurses, the receptionists. And one of the things that we wanted is with our branding and our confidence in our branding and the, the continued presence of this branding, and we've been around for about five years now, that people would have confidence in us and what we said. So that if a nurse, for example, wanted to introduce something to their practice, and they said, well, look, Cam's doing this and it's been really received well, and they bring it in and they show it's really well graphics and it's you know presented well, it will give confidence in the practice manager or the vet or the receptionist that it's got to be something solid and it works because they wouldn't have made all this effort. Mm -hmm. um, so do bear that in mind. So other things that are happening in, in the vet world, we've got ISFM, amazing branding, amazing solid organization, reliable evidence-based approach, respected people behind the platform, if you go in and say, I want to do ISFM Silver Award, 
the parents go, oh, yeah, well, we respect that. That's, that's fair. Yeah, recognize. And fear free. You know, that's really disseminated in the UK now. It's well branded, it's well structured, it's got some good names behind it. It's, it's respected. So please, I, it sounds a bit arrogant of me to say, but try and, try and help us help you and go in with some of our material and say that this is working. You know, they're growing, the public like it. Let's let Go with this, and that's the modeling. You know, this, yeah. this you no, know, it, it, it's just another component of that behavior change, yeah. And to be honest, though, um, a kind of a lot of what can the team there's 30 to 40 of us now, it's always changing. Um, I think we just go on this kind of gut feeling of this, this, this should work, some things work, some things don't work. Um, but yeah, thanks. I'm gonna call it modeling now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of things in your papers that I just wanted to mention because I thought they were really, really interesting. 25% of New Zealand vets are concerned of the owner's budget and it influences their pain management strategy. That's quite heavy figures, isn't it? Yeah, and that's that's without that's like without a question. That's just a, that's just a feeling. You know, people report that they're too worried to bring it up because they're worried about budgets. Yeah, that's a lot of people. So bear that in mind. There's a oh, there's a chance that the vet you're speaking to in their brain they're like, oh, I don't want to offend this owner. Oh, you know. So just say to them, I'm open to all options. Or if you if you can't say, you know, I am a little bit tied for finances, but I'm going to put a hell of a legwork into the physical. You know, all the changes. Talk to me what my options are. I will have to ask a price point for each of them. But please don't hold back. Let me know. I won't be offended if I have to say no. Okay. So just create that um i love this one the lack of protocols hamper action but old protocols can hamper change i loved that and that's really true and that applies to the nurses a practice that's been doing it the same way for 10 years it's hard work to try and get a change in place mm -hmm. so pick yourself up if it doesn't happen overnight i worked with this vet he's an amazing vet um dr andrew denning He's a fellow of the Royal Vet College. He is a specialist in imaging. And he said to me once, if you get a 1% change, you've done well. And I was horrified. So um, me and a lovely lady called Emily King, we tidied the practice for the weekend. We put all the scissors where they should be, the pill poppers where they should be, you know, the tourniquets where they should be. And we're like, stay there, we're gonna label it. And within a week, they'd all gone. <laughs> It all gone, and he took me aside and said, don't be disheartened, Hannah. One percent change is still an achievement. I was like, God, <laughs> it's going to take a hundred times as long. So do remember that. Um, bigger practices often have better analgesia. Woo! That's a that's a blinding statement. Can you explain that? Yeah. So I think that probably comes down. There there are various factors that influence it, but quite a lot of it is around social opportunity. Because basically, the more the more people you have in one practice, the more kind of dilution effect there is. So if one person doesn't doesn't do something, and they see a whole load of other people do it, and the, the chances are there probably will be, they're they're less likely to adhere to their own small incorrect beliefs. So that may be one factor. There are other factors about you know practice policy and so and kind of standardisation and expectations. There are various things that can do that, but we. As vets, we, we you know sometimes we, we push back on protocol. We think, oh, you know, actually we we know best. Our judgment is always right. But there's a lot to be said for protocol, in ter especially with pain management, when we should be applying a precautionary principle anyway. So if we can't tell whether or not an animal's in pain, and there's an indication it, that it is, we should be assuming the animal's in pain rather than assuming it's not, because the risk of it going the wrong way is too high. And actually, that's what protocols do, is they help to make sure the precautionary principle is implemented. Yeah, 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 definitely. And a lot of the, the well, all of the key pain specialists that I just kind of go, oh, you're amazing. They say if a procedure would be painful to you, then it is more than likely going to be painful to that animal. So provision should be put in place. And I think that's a massive step forward in the last decade that we actually go, hmm, that could hurt you. I'm, I don't want that. I'm going to do some stuff. Um, yeah, there was the old myth that I wanted to just mention. There are a lot of old myths. Pain post-op is good. Let's deal with that now. No. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I, when I went into practice 10 years ago, um, my boss at the time didn't think that there was, didn't think that spades were painful. 
at all, really. Like we didn't, yeah. So then we had to change things very quickly. The eyes just yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I have a uterus. Are you okay with that? Exactly. So, um, yeah, the people used to think that if you, you know, you could use pain to restrict an animal's movement, but we, we now we now say that that is very, is it's very unethical. And part of that is that animals can't consent. We haven't got they haven't got the language. They can't consent. So the only way that we can justify doing something that is potentially painful is to make sure that they don't suffer for it. Yeah. And just to put it into um, reality, there wasn't, it wasn't too long ago, we didn't think babies felt pain. And so, pain the newborns was terrible. So if I had, if I had had um, a heart defect when I was born, um, then probably what would have happened is that um, I would have been paralysed and I would have been given oxygen and my chest would have been cut open. And if I had any tears, they would have been seen as a, um, a physiological reflex. Um, because my tiny body would not have been thought fit to cope with pain relief or general anaesthesia. So when I was a clinical anaesthetist, um, I learned about the Amanda Hickey paper, which was the first one that was published six months after I was born, that said, actually, you know, these premature and neonatal babies, we think they are feeling pain. And it was kind of, it kind of rocked the medical world. And that was because of a mother who was a lawyer, um, a woman called Jill Lawson, his little boy Jeffrey was born premature with a heart defect and he had surgery and he died and she requested his medical records and was horrified at what she found and she said how you know how is it that you could ask anyone so it actually makes me up it makes me feel physically upset physically nauseated she said how is it you could ask anyone on the street whether a baby would feel pain if you cut it and they would tell you yes, and yet an entire profession that is supposed to be caring says that my baby can't feel pain. And thanks to her campaigning, which really shows the importance of owners and parents picking up, then she had some doctors who listened, she had some doctors who published papers, and things changed. But yeah. my 1987, what? That's crazy, isn't it? So guys, think about that. That's only, what, my brain, 33 years ago. That's not long. That's not long, and the vet profession is always going to be slightly behind. You know, that's just the nature of things. But yeah, I, I find it's 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 scary because I I got into chronic pain um, a few years ago, and we now know that these interventions done at that early age can leave them in post-operative pain for for life. You know, jeez, crazy stuff. Okay, well, I think we handled that one very well. <laughs> um. So if someone listening thinks my practice could benefit from this, what next? Your advice? Can bespoke practice training. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think the, the, in order to change a, a, a whole ecosystem with lots of different people, you need to make sure that you involve, involve those all in the same discussion. And that's yeah. where the sort of training that you run, where you do educate the, the, the receptionists and you educate the nurses, and you talk to the vets and you bring everyone together is absolutely vital. Because if you are all speaking the same message and you're all supporting each other, you can deliver so much better care. The synergy is enormous. Rather than focusing all of your efforts on educating the one poor vet who's at the end of the syringe or the end of the pill bottle, like that's just not an efficient way of changing that single person's behavior. No, and I think this is um, this is something for all CPD providers to start thinking about, is that I know that there has been countless times in my 18-year career where I've gone on a CPD day, which might be four or 500 pounds for one day, and I come back and I'm infused, I'm excited, I've got my notes, I'm going to refer back to them, the fact that I only remembered for like 5 10%, but it doesn't matter, I've got my book, I'm going to change the world. And within two days, the book is in a drawer, and I've gone back to my old routine because I've got too many barriers to elicit change so just so you know guys we do come to your practice we train receptionists for an hour and a half we then train nurses for an hour and a half practice stays open we then do the whole team for an hour it's all fun it's fun and then we do the vets for two hours in the afternoon so in one day we've trained up to 70 people in one day we want to go bigger test us then we can meet your meet your expectations um so we are now minutes we've got 10 top tips Unless you want to add anything else. No, that's great. Let's do it. For ages. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start number 10. So people that are new to CAM, um, 10 top tips should happen after every Facebook Live. And they are tips no matter your price, capabilities, 
physical capabilities, what breed, what age, we try and make sure that they're universally informative and helpful. So I'm going to start with tip number 10, and I have to use my fingers because I lose count. Tip number 10 for me is weight loss, weight loss, weight loss, weight loss, weight loss, weight loss, weight loss. We really need to be aware that we can't see that our pets are overweight anymore. We know that about 68% of dogs are overweight, 68% of own dogs are overweight. And we know that I think it's around about 79% of owners can't see it, can't see it. So that means that very likely you listening to me now have, has an overweight pet and you haven't actually recognized it. So do me a favor, go pretend your pet isn't yours, look for chest and it comes up into an abdomen. Chest, abdomen, from the top, hourglass figure, chest, hind quarters, feel a rib. I want it to feel like your knuckles, okay? Feel a rib. If it's not there, get, get a check with your nurse, nurse. Okay, number nine. God, that, that was that was my first one, but um, never mind. I will go with another one, which is encourage micro movements. Um, so the more the more you don't want to be at any point doing loads and loads and loads. But what you want to do is, if you think about all of the muscles and all of the joints in your incredibly complex dog body, you want to make sure that they are all moving. And so. What you can do, there are, there are lots of things you can do to try and get your dog doing these micro movements. So things like puzzle feeding, you get a whole load of the, the normal loading behavior and the excitement. Um, time for off lead exploration, doesn't have to be a long walk, but just giving them time to have a sniff and to, to do normal dog things. And um, getting up and getting down. So actually, you know, just if your dog likes to follow you and you leave the room, why not get up out of your chair a few times and leave the room? That's very good for you and for your dog. Um, lots of very short outings, so you know if you need to nip from the post box, do do just think about building lots of little bits of movement into your day, hiding the toy, and also um, time to just help the dog do small amounts of things that are a little bit taxing, like walking on stones, like walking on slopes, like all of those things. But you're recruiting a wider variety of muscles and a wider range of movement motion. Love it, God, you're amazing. Um, and yeah, that's another myth, isn't it? Oh, they need to be rested. Oh, they need to be rested. That's that's old hat now, guys. That's long gone. I did okay. a project on osteoarthritis in people, and the problem is, is when it's painful and you sit in the same position and the cartilage is under compression, it doesn't have the normal nutrient flow. You're worsening the situation. So actually, even though it's a bit uncomfortable, the more you move it, the less you're focusing that pressure. Oh my God, you're coming back. You know that. <laughs> You've done that as rabbits, as well as innovation, as well as anesthesia. Feeling a little bit insecure now. <laughs> um, number eight for me is always, always flooring. flooring, 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 flooring. I say it every single time because it's so important. I'm getting oranger because there's a computer screen in front of me. So I'm not fake tanning whilst we're doing this. <laughs> I feel like I've gone umpa lumpa. Let me just turn the lights on. Two seconds. <laughs> Hopefully that's going to make things. See, I'm a normal. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah flooring it's so it's so affordable it's so sensible and it really helps them behaviorally as well because they're more confident and they're more likely to engage and they're more likely to move so don't have laminates everywhere and put rugs down put runners down think about how to make sure they don't slip trip stumble and fall and game changer okay, number seven Okay, um, so I'm an innovation consultant. When we do a project, we set really clear criteria at the start so we make sure we keep to them. And my, my advice would be set really objective criteria for when you need to, for, for tracking how your dog moves and when you need to see the vet. So, you know, if I see him do X, this is a sign I should call my vet. If I see him do Y, I need to think of this. So setting those criteria, really important for making sure that when you're in a little bit more of an emotional state, you have something to fall back on. Love that. Um, and that fits in with a download called a chronic pain indicator chart where you choose your pain indicators. You can grade them. So you have your own reminder of, I promised myself when I saw deterioration, I would do this. And that is in the downloads and resources. So go dig it out. Um, for me, a common one that I see a lot of is habits, terrible habits. And today alone, I had to remind three owners with severely arthritic dogs that ball playing um, is not cool now. No. And to be honest, I'm a bit anti-ball throwing a lot. But 
Um, these dogs have terrible arthritis in their digits, in their elbows, in their shoulders. Do -do -do -do. Oh, I'm going to go do <laughs> Sounded like Donald Trump then, didn't I? Um, but yeah, seriously, that's not going to help with concussive torsional forces for really vulnerable joints. Um, so these habits, the other one was jumping in the river and the slippery rocks, so the Tweed, where I'm near, the River Tweed, it's just rocks and algae. So these dogs running into the river, the legs are going every direction, thanks man. Think about your routines and your habits and question them. Number five. Good. Um, so my advice would be to work with your vet to find what you can control. So the more you can control in the, in the management of your dog's arthritis, the easier it is, is for you to be motivated and for you to feel that you can change things. So um, I talked about defining criteria, but also defining the objective. So you want your dog to still be comfortable at the end of his 20 minute walk, you know, still be able to move and sit down easily. And then you know, talk to your vet, how, what, what's gonna happen if your dog is really painful? What, what are the steps that go through there? You know, how are you going to make sure the dose is sufficient? Like, if you, if you understand what you can control, then you've got much better ability to like, take ownership of that situation. Yeah, that's a good one. And I think people, don't realize how much owner psychology and owner empowerment, and owner training is required to manage this disease well. You know, mm -hmm. we've been um, an industry that love pets, you know, we really do, but we have just kind of gone, here's, here's the drug and uh, see you in three months. And we have to, so hopefully Cam's gonna help, help vets around the UK, around the globe achieve that. Number four for me, it's just in my brain and out of my brain. Oh, I know. Help them up harnesses or any harness of such kind that actually supports the rear end. Sorry, I did an Apple iPhone thing then, didn't I? <laughs> smartphone. Um, yeah, so uh, I get really peeved that these aids, these mobility aids, are used as a salvage situation rather than a rehabilitation aid. You would not give your grandma a Zimmer frame when she couldn't walk. You'd give it to her while she was beginning to show signs of struggling to prevent prevent you know things related to muscle fatigue and proprioceptive deficits and stuff you want them to be able to use that zimmer frame to improve their muscular situation so that they can get back the life that they had so introducing these support harnesses early will actually revive your dog's capabilities you might use them intermittently so you start off using them quite a bit and then suddenly you realize you need to use them less but don't wait until they can't walk too late. Number three. Um, so I do a lot of uh, behaviour work, so I would say training, and I would say continue to train new behaviours to your older dog. So most arthritic dogs will be older. Um, and if you can keep getting the dog to um, think of different things and to show different behaviours and to be rewarded, you, it's then much more easy to teach behaviours that are actually physio in disguise. It's much more easy for them to um, show a wider range of movement because you're asking them to, you know, find different things they can do with a toy, for example. There are lots of fantastic things to teach. And it also substitutes for some of the, if your dog's always had really long walks, it gives some of that mental stimulation and the thought processing and the interaction with the owners in a different context. Like it. So that was number three, wasn't it? So I'm number so I'm going to let you think about number one, because it is a big, it's a lot of pressure here. Number one is you, so I'm going to just spend a little time. Number two is something really close to my heart. Cam started in like 2015, 2016, because I wanted more people to understand chronic pain. I really wanted people who love their dogs to be able to identify it early and put into place a management plan that wasn't heavily drug reliant, wasn't end stage care. I wanted people of all financial backgrounds to be able to do something positive for their dog. And if the truth is, the earlier we catch it, the more likely we can create a management plan that isn't really expensive, isn't hugely physically draining and time consuming. So how do we do that? We have to talk about it and we have to get people being aware that this is a big problem. You know, 80% of dogs over the age of eight, 20% of all dogs, we think those figures are really too low. Duncan Lascelles has just released a, well, released a paper, 35% of all dogs already have OA, 35%. So we know it's very prevalent, but we're not seeing these cases because people aren't identifying signs early. So let me just hype up this stuff. Cam tries to create a movement. On the back of this sweatshirt, it says, hashtag your dog more years. That's what it is, your dog get more years. So by embracing this 
cap approach, wearing clothing, the bandanas, the greenies, baseball caps. We're spreading a message to other dog owners and dog lovers of we can together identify this disease earlier and we will get more years for your dog. It's only going to work if you guys get behind this movement. So please pop to the shop. We're completely self-funded and times are hard with COVID. So we would really gratefully appreciate pop to the shop, buy a bandana, buy a booklet, buy a pack of business cards, give them out to your dog loving friends. Help us help you. Number one. Um, have you looked into time restricted feeding? Do you recommend that as part of your arthritis strategy? What's the say again? Time restricted feeding. So, Ooh. so in humans, um, there is some preliminary work and quite a lot of interest in um, reducing the number of feeding opportunities in a day to maximise the amount of time that the dog spends in a non-insulin dominant state. And in humans, if for osteoarthritis, there's evidence that restricting food within a very small window in the day or even every other day can help to quite substantially alleviate joint pain and so actually oh. my, my my thing that i would add to this discussion would be consider helping your dog to in effect fast so just give it one meal a day give all of your food in that one feeding interval puzzle feed it great do what you want but then don't give points and don't give more food outside that period and obviously, See, that's that's, yeah. no, this is really interesting. And this is why Pam is exciting, guys, because it is completely frontline chat. Um, we've gone completely the other way because we use it to keep the dog moving, to keep them distracted. So we know that the positive brain state of feeding releases the serotonins and the mm -hmm. dopamine. And we want the owner dog bonds, which has been adapted because the dog is more restricted. That's really interesting. No one has said this. So that's fascinating. But in humans, they found that feeding once a day and then starving has an effect on pain state. Yeah, we know. I mean, it's the the kind of time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting. There are lots of different names for it. Um, that encompasses the whole spectrum of regimes from um, I'm going to you know the five two diet to the you know only eating in a in an eight hour window every day um, to you know week you know week long fasts every three months. And all of those are very slightly different things to your endocr endocrinology, but for dogs, for humans, we're not grazers, so we're designed to eat a meal and then have quite a period where we're not eating. And what yeah. the evidence suggests is that when we have multiple feeding intervals, the insulin spike that results lasts for um, a couple of hours. And so if we're feeding yeah. every point, you know, within like every couple of hours, the dog is always in that insulin state, which is promoting fat storage, which is promoting um, kind of a like a lot of growth. And we, we don't want growth. Once we've done our growing, we want to have limited levels of growth hormones because otherwise we end up triggering a whole load of chronic diseases, um, which are problematic in a nutshell. But for pain and for a chronic inflammatory state, you really want to be keeping the insulin level down for as long as possible. And that so will how, be how, this is no, this is really fascinating because no one has said that before, which is really cool because it's new, it's novel, we want to learn. But how would we be able to give that dog pleasure um, on a routine, like hour to two hourly basis, get them up, get them moving, get those joints lubricated, as you say. Where's the balance? So we use licky mats and snuffle mats and Kongs quite a lot. And I, years, have said to owners, you know, pre-make up some little kind of um, Tupperware tray, just lace it a little bit of, you know, their wet dog food. So when you're working on your laptop and suddenly three hours have passed, you can put it down, you get them up, get them moving, get them moving, but you're at work. How could we get around that then? So there are very things. That's the other thing just to, to say. Is there, is there clinical trials of that understanding in dogs or is this just only human work? Now? This is only humans. I'm, so what I'm, what I'm bringing here is my perspective as to what I think is probably, I don't actually, I don't know, I don't know whether or not it's coming in the veterinary practice because a lot of the nutrition research is sponsored by pet food manufacturers who do a lot of great stuff, but um, interventions where they sell less food is not great. So that's why the weight loss diet focus on changing onto a different yeah. food rather than not feeding for a period. But yeah. certainly in animal trials and now in human studies, there's very clear benefits to having periods where you're not in a fed state. 
Um, mm. So things that you things that you could do. Well, fat, for example, fat stimulates insulin much, much, much less than carbohydrates and protein. So yeah. um, potentially things that are basically oil based or lard or something like that in small quantities as a taste in, as an interest thing that might be, that might be fine. Things Smell like, and taste, yeah, yeah, yeah. taste, etc. Um, things like going out for a short walk or going into the garden or you know hiding preferred toys that they have to find um like i mean there are a lot here yeah, they even for a dog that likes placing balls you know throwing a ball for the dog to catch from you know there, there's sort of things that you can do that are yeah, yeah. low level um in terms of joint stress but are still quite stimulating and so there will be a proportion of dogs that are very food dependent but actually i think there's a, a whole another interesting piece which is what are the other things that we can do for our arthritic mm. dogs that are not food based i think that's fascinating because actually thinking back at one of the facebook lives with daryl millis he mentioned fasting but for the weight aspect mm -hmm. he wasn't about insulin and the effect on chronic pain management so i might have to go and do a bit of research yeah and i can certainly i mean i can we, we can talk offline as well hannah because there's, there's loads of interesting stuff but it, i'm sure you've all heard that if you calorie restrict mice they live for a lot longer than if you don't calorie restrict mice but what they've recently realized is when they were trying to calorie restrict mice what they did was gave, gave them 75 percent of their ration once a day and so suddenly what the mice would do is eat all of their ration immediately and then they would have you know some of them were fed every day some of them were fed every other day so now you have i think so what's calorie restriction and what is fasting well, what is the difference here if we gave them a pellet every hour is that equivalent you know it's not biochemically equivalent to having a meal a day so i think one of the massive trends in human nutrition at the moment is thinking not just about what we eat but when we eat and I think that is probably coming for animals, but certainly for animals with chronic disease. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. This is what I mean, guys. So these Facebook lives, there is a lot of thought put behind them. And Gwen is in the innovation industry and she's got her fingers in pies that we haven't. You know, she knows stuff that's going on. And that's what makes Cat great. People like you. No, that's interesting. If you can share stuff with me, and then um, maybe we can have a chat further on another live because you're very easy to talk to. <laughs> cool. Well, guys, we've been chatting for like 81, 82 minutes now. And um, I've got a home photo, and I'm sure you've got, you know, that what you might I've got be to eat. <laughs> I'm going to collect my dog. I'm going to collect Luna. Thank you so much, Gwen. That's amazing. I've definitely learned stuff. Um, I hope you guys have too. I hope that you can go to your vet practice and get more out of them. You know, because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing. So till next time, I'm going to put the links to the articles down here. I'll put a couple of images of the diagrams in case you don't want to read the article so you can see what we were talking about. I'd like you all to say a massive thank you to Gwen. Um, fantastic. Brilliant. And we will see you next week. See you later. Bye. Lovely to speak to you all. <laughs>